uh, Ron Knopf is, is our main guest this evening. He had, uh, he'll tell more of his own story. Um, uh, Steve Simpson, I'll introduce him in a second as well. Let him introduce himself in a second as well. I just want to say for myself that I will never ever forget my experience with these guys last year because they were here right as COVID started. Um, they, they came on a, like on a month, the, the week that everything locked down, I think a week that all of us remember, they were here with us. So we had an event Tuesday evening of that week here in our office in focus. And by Wednesday, Thursday, everything that we were doing had been canceled. And by Saturday, when they went home, we were, uh, really wondering whether everything was going to work out okay for them to leave. So it was, uh, uh, unforgettable week. Um, so Steve Simpson is one of the two co-founders of Global Leadership Partners. So Steve, if you could introduce yourself and just for a minute, say a little bit about who Global Partners is and where you guys came from. Okay, so thank you, Nolan. Uh, a few years back, two of us uh, began this journey uh, of traveling to Europe, Eastern Europe and uh, Central Asia uh, to share information. Uh, based on our careers and the experience we've had. We've done a lot of seminars in universities and professional groups for the past seven years, actually. But a few years ago, we became incorporated and we've added now another 63 speakers. So we are a group of professionals uh, from all different uh, backgrounds, uh, professional backgrounds. I myself am an, am an engineer. I work in engineering management for Procter & Gamble uh, out of Cincinnati, Ohio, and that's where I live now. But I've lived in several different states and in Japan. And uh, we still travel, although uh, this past year has presented some difficulties for us. So we're doing these by Zoom. We hope to come back and see you in person. Uh, this picture is my family. I have three uh, married children and 15 grandchildren. Hopefully in a few months, I'm gonna have my first great grandchild. And as I said, I'm uh, out of Cincinnati, Ohio. And I've been out of Procter & Gamble but for about 14 years and I consult with profits and nonprofits and, and I volunteer uh, a lot, mm -hmm. coaching, mentoring. And, uh, and so we're glad to be here today. I'm not gonna be the main speaker today. So I'm gonna turn you over to Ron Knopf. Good evening. <laughs> I'm very excited about being here. Uh, this is, uh, I've been with Global Leadership about just about three years now. Uh, this is my family. Uh, my wife is standing behind me. I have three grown adult daughters. They're married to the guys they're standing next to. The little guy in my arms is, he's eight years old. He's my son. <clears throat> we adopted him when we lived in China. Um, beyond this picture, I have four grandchildren that uh, my, da my daughters have given our family and we have one more on the way due uh, next month. So very exciting okay. times in the, in the Knopf house. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get right into this uh, presentation on, on negotiations. Um, Ron, maybe just, uh, yeah, jump in there real quick. Uh, <laughs> please feel free to uh, write comments or questions as, as Ron goes through his presentation, it'll make it easier for us to get the conversation going. Um, and if there's something that's, that's uh, very, um, uh, uh, maybe, you know, uh, a, a question you have as he's going along, feel free to um, also write it in the, in the chat and I'll see if I can maybe interrupt him if I need to. Thanks, Ron. And, and might I say, if, if you are comfortable in English and can write them in English, um, that would help, but it's okay to be in Croatian also. Yeah, we, we hope to have enough time at the end to answer any questions that are, that are listed in the chat box. Uh, negotiations is a, is a bit of a broad um, skill technique. There's lots of things we negotiate every day of our lives for different reasons, some, some small negotiations, some big. Um, I'm gonna give it some examples and some techniques, um, but, but whatever questions you have, we hope to, to save a half an hour at the end to answer those questions. So, so high level here, this is my aim for today. So question, have you ever walked away from an agreement and felt the results were inequitable or unbalanced? Have you ever wished you could negotiate with confidence? And then who enjoys a negotiating an agreement? So my aim today is for you to enjoy um, 
agree, negotiating agreements and have confidence and always have a fair and equitable end to your negotiations. So a bit of a question here that I'd like to have some chat box um, response from if I could get it is um, what makes for a successful negotiation? Who could, what does that feel like, look like? The successful negotiations. Anybody have any uh, ideas? I'm looking at the chat box. The outcome where both parties are satisfied. Yes, very good answer. It's the win-win thinking that uh, both walk away with uh, what they feel is, is proper and correct for them. Fulfillment, good answer. Hmm. Anything else? Transparent sharing of the information. Yeah, it's always good to negotiate um, when the information is open and fair and understood and there's nothing hidden. It's a very good, uh, good response, negotiation. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna move on and talk a little bit about preparation. For me, this is the most important element, is the preparation for the negotiation. And I always like to start with, condition your mind for a win-win. What we're looking for there is you come in with an attitude and a heart that you wanna see a mutual benefit. And there's an important reason for this. Because if you come into a negotiation and you're looking for a win-lose, it becomes competitive and difficult. It relies on power, position, possessions, maybe personality. And ultimately, it becomes a bigger challenge. And what I find is when people come into negotiation with the win-lose thinking, uh, we don't end up with a negotiation. People will feel and understand where your heart's at in negotiation and they will typically walk away. So, so step one, get your, your mind thinking win-win. We're gonna walk away with an equitable agreement for both parties. So number two, plan on emotions to be high. Um, people are emotional. Negotiations can cause some level of anxiety. They could cause some level of um, nervousness maybe. And, and you could get some fireworks. It's, I've seen it many times and I've seen negotiations that went quiet and easy, but I've seen the fireworks. So if you're the calming voice in the room, when the fireworks are over, you'll be able to get everything back on track easily and get, get the system moving the way you should. So you learn, and another preparation is to learn all you can about the other party. I'm talking about their values, their needs, maybe their track record when it, when it comes to negotiations. How's that worked in the past? Aspirations, goals, and culture. I'm gonna explain why you need to know all this information a little bit later in the story. Fourthly, negotiate with decision makers. It's always, <laughs> for me, um, no fun negotiate with people that can't make decisions because I feel like I'm wasting my time. I'm going to give you a bit of a story. It's a very recent story. I, I belong to a large gym or an organization, a workout um, community, and it's, it's all over America and in multiple countries. And the reason I belong to this group is because when I work out, I'm always in different locations. So I want to have that flexibility. To, no matter where I'm traveling, I have a gym to work out in. Well, during COVID, <clears throat> I went to visit my daughter up in northern Ohio or Southern Ohio, which is, I'm, I live in Tennessee, which is a couple states south of Ohio. And I was gonna be there for a month. And I went to the gym and I walked in and they said, well, you know, with COVID, you, you can't work out here. Um, I said, well, you know, I've been a member of this organization for 30 years, I, I don't understand. Well, we're only letting, people are only gonna work out in their very first initial organization in their hometowns. When you're traveling, we can't, we can't honor this national agreement because we're, we just, we have a new policy, short-term policy change. I said, well, okay, it was a little disappointing. My, my hometown is four hours away. It looks like I'm not gonna work out for a month. So I said, well, was there an exception to the policy? And the person said, well, no, you can talk to the manager. I said, okay, so I talked to the manager. 
the manager gave me a story that didn't make any sense to me. And I said, well, who else could I talk to? Well, we have a CEO who runs the whole organization. And I thought, well, this is interesting. We have a, a workout facility with a gym and a pool and a set of weights and it has a CEO. So I said, oh, this is who I need to talk to. They must be the decision maker. And so I set an appointment and I come back and I meet with this fellow. Good news is we turned out we both go to the, we both attended the same university. So we had a great kickoff conversation about our experience of working in the university. And as we talked a bit, I said, hey, look, uh, what's, what's going on with this? People can't work out, new policies, short term. And he said, yeah, with COVID, we're trying to limit the number of people that are working out here. I said, okay, that makes sense. And then I said, well, I'm looking around and there's not a lot of people here. He said, well, this is our slow time. We're really trying to limit it during our busy times. And I said, hey, look, I'll make you a deal. You let me work out here for the next month and I'll only come the time of days that is convenient for you when there's low outcome or, or low number of people. And we, we reached an agreement. So I had to go through a couple of chains of command to get to the decision maker. But once I got to the decision maker, we were able to negotiate something that worked for both of us. And then lastly, on the preparation, is determine your BATNA. This is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. I, I learned this term when I read a book called Getting to Yes by Richards and Urey. They're part of the Harvard negotiating team. And, and I, I believe probably more of a gold standard when it comes to negotiation. The book was written in 1981. Um, good book, uh, strong detail, and a lot of the information and the tools I use, I learned from this book. But what is a best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Well, this is your walk away point. You need to know what makes sense for you and at what point to walk away. You also need to know and be able to recognize what a fair agreement looks like. So prior to going into an agreement, write down for you what a win looks like for your organization so you know when to act or when to, to leave. Tips for engagement. Number one, <clears throat> excuse me, be likable. Negotiators are people first. Always want to work on the relationship. You want to understand the people. You want to understand who they are, what they care about, and to be likable is very, very important. Publicly praise, be genuine and transparent. And I think we saw this in the, in the chat, transparency side, very important. Um, this is not a battle. First thing you do is listen, and then you listen, and you listen some more and, and, and respond when someone makes a great point. And, hey, that's a good point. Um, I agree with that in principle. Uh, try to develop the conversation. Another kind of a small detail, but I, I see very, very valuable is to sit on the same side of the table. You know, the reality is you want to develop this cooperative or collaborative environment. And if you're facing each other, it feels more competitive. Um, if, you, if you can, always sit in the side. Now, now in the movies, you see these, these um, negotiations where people are face-to-face, -face, maybe a dark room, and they're talking through it. They're trying to, to understand and try to win that argument or the negotiation or, or decide what, what position is going to prevail. And that does work in the movies. But remember, the movies, the outcome is decided by the script writer. You don't have a script writer. You're the script writer and you need to develop this, um, what I call a collaborative positioning in the room. Okay, next is arrive early. Now this is where you have these sidebar conversations where people are more calm. It doesn't have to be about the negotiation. It's where you get to know people. You know, and I, it reminds me of a story. Uh, years ago, I'd worked in a, an organization in Michigan and we were launching a new product. It was an automatic transmission. And we had created some defects and shipped them, which means they went into vehicles. Well, <clears throat> there's nothing worse for a vehicle plant to install a major part of their vehicle, like a transmission, and turn out it has a problem. Because it means they gotta take it back out. So when this happens, you get, you get summons to the vehicle plant to explain what happened, what you did about it, and why it's never gonna happen again. And this particular time, we had shipped roughly 50 units that got into vehicles 
and it was really disrupting to the vehicle plant. And I was responsible because I was a launch manager. Well, so I get summoned to the vehicle plant and I had heard stories. I'd never done this before. I'd never been to a vehicle plant to discuss a problem that at this particular place, they were very tough, a little bit mean, and actually a little bit intimidating. And I was a little nervous about this. Am I gonna go there? They're gonna say mean things to me. Are they gonna listen to me? Is it gonna be ugly? You know, and I had all these things going through my mind. Uh, keep in mind, I'm 30 years old and so I'm a bit younger. So I drive there, it's a four hour drive. I get there early, of course. So I leave at three in the morning. I walk in and I'm an hour early. Well, the layout of the room looks like this. There's a podium down at the bottom and then there's these chairs lined up in this graduating higher elevation setup. So people are looking down at the podium. And I thought, wow, I'm gonna have to stand at this podium and people are gonna be up there looking down on me and asking me questions. This could be, you know, I was a little even more nervous. <laughs> then I look around, there's a guy in an office and he's at his computer typing and I Hmm, I'll meet him and find out what's really going on here. So I meet him and it turned out he is the quality director. He's going to host the meeting. Good news. I'm an hour early. Let's talk. I said, hey, listen, I'm, I'm a little tired. I've been driving for four hours. Where can I get a coffee? He says, hey, come with me. I'll show you. So we walk down the hall and we talk a bit. And of course, I buy his coffee. That just makes sense. Um, but we talked about the issue why I'm there, and what's going on. And what happened? Why it's never going to happen again? And he said, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Sounds like you got a good plan. He said, I'll tell you what, when we get started, I'll, put, I'll move you first on the agenda. Therefore, you can get out early and get out of here. So oh, great. I really appreciate it. Anyway, so the meeting starts and it's just as I had imagined. A group of people stand above me, looking down, asking questions. And I'm at the podium and it looks like I'm going to be eating for lunch. Anyway, I start to talk. Immediately, people were asking questions before I finish. Not very nice, kind of a rough tone of voice. Well, this quality manager stands up. He puts his hand up in the air and he says, wait a minute. Listen to Ron. He's got a good, he's got a good story. He knows what's going on. We need to get him out of here. Move on to something more important. Perfect. Everything quieted down. I was able to tell my story, negotiate my way through this, and I was out the door in 10 minutes on my way back home. I never forgot that, always arrive early. And lastly, on engagement tips, keep your focus on the goal. Oftentimes in negotiation, you can go different directions and people, personalities will come into play and that's okay, but always keep bringing everything back to the goal. Things to avoid. I think this is obvious, but it's worth mentioning. Insults, criticism, sarcasm, not needed, causes problems. Never redu reduce the choices on the table. Uh, less choices make, they make people feel like you're taking something away before you get started. Uh, avoid using you pronouns. Try, here is what I heard, not what, you, not what you said. Or I feel, not you broke your word. Uh, never shorten the deadline, only add stress. Use, using an uncomfortable room adds stress. Hunger adds anxiety, and showing up late is really bad because it's disrespectful to people's time. All right, let's talk about the method. This is actually very, very simple. Focus <clears throat> on interests, not positions. Positions are limiting. They don't provide enough information to solve a problem or create any possibility for creativity. Interests will provide, de will provide detail around desires and fuel discussions. What you're trying to get at is what are the real needs in the room? What are the real desires? Are there concerns? Are there fears? Reconcile interest rather than positions. This works for both parties. For every interest, there usually exists several possible positions that could easily satisfy the interest. And lastly, why? Move deeper. You wanna ask the question why, but be clear, you're not trying to get them to justify the position because you wanna get away from the positional discussion. You wanna understand interests, needs, 
in hopes. The next part of the process is invent options for mutual gain. This is where you be creative. I call this expanding the pie before dividing it. Um, you want to talk about everything behind the positions. And that's what I call expanding the pie. It's a time to be creative. Now for the decision makers, and most leaders are decision makers, you always want, you always want to go right to decisions. Get it out of your mind. What you really want to do is imagine new options. Imagine different ways of getting to this point. Imagine the conversations that you need to have. What are the interests, desires, and needs? Brainstorming, great tool. Most of us have some level of skill in terms of brainstorming, but have a brainstorming session. What are the different options out there? You can bring in experts. I've, I've used consulting experts many a time, to try to come up with better ideas and connect some ideas. And then lastly, Select the most preferable options, discuss and develop variants. So these variants gives us options and to come through for additional decisions and different ideas. Um, the variants um, kind of let people's anxiety go down and say, well, let's just talk about this. Let's talk about that. Because um, really what you're trying to do is come up with a conversation where you can get together. Now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and talk about. So, did I do that well, Nolan? Screen sharing over? Yep, yep. Okay. <laughs> I want to talk about what, what I consider one of my biggest and most complex negotiations of my career and, and how that worked and how I use some of these tools to come up with a um, a solution that worked for the entire team. So in 2012, uh, I was asked to, to move to China, become part of a joint venture. The joint venture was uh, with Ford Motor Company, a company called Chang'an, and we created a new company called Chang'an Ford. Um, it was a very exciting time. Uh, the Ford Motor Company wanted to build five factories in three years, hire 25,000 people, at a cost of $5 billion, and we would become from the number 12 supplier of cars in mainland China to the fifth largest supplier. So very exciting, but a very, very big role. Uh, my initial role, I was only responsible for one site. So I was gonna help build or be responsible as a director a level job um, to build this transmission, automatic transmission site. So it was about a billion dollars investment and we wanted to increase our ability to make automatic transmissions in that country by 1 million units. Actually, prior to that, they had a small company where they imported automatic transmissions, but we were gonna build them on site. So it was a great career opportunity, um, really a great adventure. Moved my family there. I signed up for initially for three years to live there. And, <clears throat> and I had a very important role as the, as the director of the uh, the powertrain division. Well, let's talk about some details behind this. Three, I want to talk about reporting structure, uh, joint venture ownership, seconded employment, and making decisions. So the reporting structure was good. Um, I had the responsibility to, to build this factory and launch it and produce this product. And I had the top position. So that's comforting because I knew that if we had difficulties or, or problems where we couldn't reach a consensus on direction, I could use my position on the org structure to help lead the group through an impasse or any type of gridlock we might be in. Next point, joint venture. So what does that look and feel like? So the joint venture was 50% owner Ford and 50% owner Chang'an to build a third company called Chang'an Ford. Well, this split in ownership would invariably assure a negotiation on most decisions. So my position changed from director, I would say, to lead negotiator. Um, seconded employment. So what does that mean? That means I worked for the Ford Motor Company, but I was on loan to the Chang'an Ford LLC for a set period of time. 
which created its own challenges. My immediate alliance was to the joint venture. This is where I worked every day. These were decisions were being made. But then again, I had my tie back to the Ford Motor Company, who actually paid me and were responsible for my career after this assignment. Um, same thing with the other company. They had seconded employees on board that were working, that had leadership positions. Um, then there's a surprise consideration. I discovered that Chinese culture, they love to negotiate. It's just what they do. There's no decision that's gonna happen day one. We're gonna talk about it, we're gonna negotiate. And I learned this early on, it's, and to me it's a bit of a funny story. I'd only been there for a few weeks and at a team dinner, we went out to dinner and we had a, <clears throat> ordered just a tremendous amount of food. It was a lot of fun and we were leaving and a, a guy that, there's a seconded employee, he's called the deputy director from the Chong'an company. He was seconded and he worked directly for me and he was out. He was hey, Ron, me. can you, could you just explain real quick, what does seconded mean in this context? I'm not sure that's a new topic, new kind of. So yeah. seconded means um, you're on loan. You work for a larger company, maybe one of the partners, but you're on loan to a third company. Or sec Some people call it seconded. So you're, you're there and you work and you're, you're seconded. Um, so you basically means you're on loan. Thanks. To the other company. Um, let's see where was it? Also, so this culture of negotiation I found out that I thought was very interesting. So we eat dinner as a big group and we're walking out and the deputy director is paying the bill, but this takes 10, 15 minutes and he keeps talking to the manager of the restaurant. So I asked the question, I said, was there something wrong with the meal that I didn't catch? Is he complaining? You know, what's going on here? And I, he said, well, he thinks the price is too high. I said, well, didn't, wasn't the price on the menu kind of like North America or what I'm used to? You pick off the menu and you kind of made that agreement when you bought it. He said, oh yeah, the price is on the menu, but we can't agree to pay because there's too many of us. We're good customers he's going to get the price at least 20 30 percent less just just let him go thought, wow this is pretty neat even after dinner you, you can renegotiate your price of what you're going to pay um, so here's here's the, the long and the short of this so how do we make decisions in a, in a company that's a 50 50 ownership between two other companies i'm seconded i'm on loan so i've got more than one reporting structure to deal with there's cultural considerations. Well, this is how we make decisions. We negotiate. We negotiate everything. <clears throat> I'll always remember the phrase, we agree in principle, but we are not aligned. This means we're about to go into a negotiation. Now, from a personal perspective, I've been in manufacturing at the time for 25 years. There's nothing new under the sun. When you launch a new program, there's a set process to do that. The equipment you buy is the same as the equipment you bought in the past. Uh, the, the operational systems are identical. To me, there's not a lot to negotiation. We just know we need to go get to work. In this particular case, this was the third time we had launched this product. It was launched in North America in, a, in an older factory that was reconditioned. It was launched in Europe on another reconditioned factory. This happened to be a greenfield site where we we're gonna build the factory from the ground up. But this was the third edition. For me, I don't, didn't think we needed to negotiate a lot of things because this was the third time we've done this. But here's what I, what I learned. There's a huge benefit in this process of negotiation, which is a bit of a game changer in my mind and in the way of thinking. Western perspective says, all this time talking about decisions is a waste of time. Asian culture, all this time talking about decision, helps us become aligned. It helps everybody understand why we're doing what we're doing, how we're gonna go do it, and how we're gonna support each other. It's actually a process of 100% buy-in, which has huge benefits on execution. Just think about the entire team. Say I've got a thousand employees, but everybody's 100% bought into the direction because we spend a lot of time understanding why we do what we do, and when we're going to do it, how we're going to do it. Execution becomes fast and efficient. Okay, my lean-in is over. I'm going to talk 
directly to what was the negotiation. This was my first negotiation with this team. Um, and I'll never forget my first day. I walk into the room. I'm the first Westerner on the ground, and there's 40 team members in the room. The average age is 24 years old. So here I am in Western China with 40 team members, employees that are part of this joint venture, and they're 24 years old. And we're arguably going to build one of the most complex manufacturing factories in the automobile business. The automatic transmission is the most technical and complex system in a vehicle. And the product to build it and manufacture is one of the most complex and technical processing manufacturing system. So the truth to be known, I was a, a bit nervous when I looked at the age of the folks around me. Quite brilliant, very smart, but very short on experience. So first things first. What's the most important step for developing a world-class manufacturing operation? It's highly motivated, exceptional people. But they just need more skills and better coaching. So the good news is this. The two companies had decided prior to me getting there that we were going to bring over a certain number of subject matter experts or people that would come along as coaches to teach the local team how to build this product. The question is, <clears throat> who would they be, how long would they stay, and what would be the right number of people. Um, so this became the negotiations. Um, so we had the agreement that we would bring subject matter experts over, and essentially this is what I was. I was a subject matter expert, and I was signed up for three years. We wanted to bring some more folks, more technical folks, and all the individual bits and pieces and understanding that we needed to build this product. So a little more background, um, Ford had assigned a, a chief of engineering who had been working with his team for the last 18 months and a project manager. And they'd been in China several times, travelers staying for six weeks at a time and going back to the US. So I consult with the engineering chief, who was by the way, planning to come over and, and live for three years. And I said, well, what do we need in terms of resources? So well, I need 15 engineers, three supervisors, and myself here for three years. I said, okay, got it. And I thought, well, taking a look at the whole system, I thought I would need about seven operational experts to come over for a total of 26 people to come over and work. So this was my going in position. I want to bring in 26 people, and I'm number 27, but I'm already there. So I go to speak to my Chang'an Ford boss, the VP of manufacturing. And I tell him, I say, Mr. Lowe, we need to bring 26 subject matter experts here for three years to work and teach the local team. And he says, okay, I agree in principle, but you need to work this out with your deputy director, reach alignment with the team and come back. I thought, well, this should be easy. The deputy director works for me. We're just going to go decide this is what we're going to do. We're going to go do it. So I go present the case to the deputy director. <clears throat> and he says, I agree in principle, but we're not aligned. So the negotiation officially began at that point. Um, this is what it looked like. So I had my chief of engineering, his name was Mark, and his project coordinator, and his name was Mark. And then the deputy director, and he had two supervisors in a room. And they were also seconded employees from the Chang'an company. And we were going to go come to some type of alignment of how many expats, we call them expatriates, people that move and live in another country for a certain amount of years for business, to come and work. So I set up the room. We talked about this early, how important the room is. So we're, we were in an off-site location. So we didn't have a building yet. We were still building our building and had classrooms. So we set up tables, small tables, where everybody could sit at, a, at their own table and look at a whiteboard. The reason I do that is I want people to look at what we're working on. We're going to do all the negotiation and the work on the right whiteboard. And in this particular context, it really worked well because most of the writing would be in English, and we had to also translate and write it in, in Mandarin. So the focus would be 
on the work. So the first round. So we talk about this a bit. <clears throat> Local team says, okay, we agree that you're here, you're number one. Mark, the chief of engineering, has already been part of our team. He's number two. We're going to do this with two people. And I thought, wow, we're pretty far away here. I'm at 26, actually 27, counting myself. This team is at two. Um, from my perspective, this was non-negotiable. What we're being asked to do, and I really understood this well, is to hire 1,500 people in 18 months, build a factory, fill it full of equipment, and run at a rate of 130 transmissions an hour for 20 hours a day to meet the 1 million volume. So we really needed some experts that have been down this road before. Ron, can I can I just ask like so is is was the tension there that when you say experts you're talking about was were you talking about bringing people from Ford from from basically outside of yeah, China exactly. and the tension was you were this is the other yeah. position was hey you can why why aren't why aren't we good enough is that is that kind of yeah, what's going I mean, on there the big deal was the folks were right out of college we had 40 people that were engineers with maybe one year experience and their experience was really working in this building a factory so, yeah, so no no real knowledge so we bring in people expats I mean by expats ex expatriates foreigners um, North American people maybe European maybe Australian but 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 Ford employees that had long years of experience um, to live in China for three years with us. So that was the big, the big negotiation. The, the problem was, and <clears throat> what I kept hearing was, this is expensive, and, and it was expensive. Um, an expat or subject matter expert moved to China for one year um, would be a cost or at least a charge to the joint venture of a half a million dollars. And so, um, with two people for three years, we would, we're talking about spending $3 million. Uh, 26 people for three years, um, this is more like closer to $40 million uh, in just consulting, if you will. So that was the big, big problem that we had. And how do we get past this? Um, my first impression was this. There really were no decision makers in the room. Um, I had already cleared the way on the Ford side um, for the 26 people to be hired. And we were actually recruiting within the company at the time. Um, the second big first impression, initial impression was um, they didn't trust me. Um, I needed the time to foster a trust-based relationship to make sure that everybody understood this was gonna be a win-win outcome. Then, then my third consideration that was very, very clear to me is negotiations are normal. Back to the restaurant idea. We're always going to negotiate everything. So I had to personally change my way of thinking that we can't just go fast and go quick. We're going to have to slow down. And I needed to control my personal anxiety uh, because I'm the kind of person who likes to go fast and go quick. So I decided to bring in a consultant. How do we move forward? What do we need to do different in terms of preparation? And I was very fortunate that the original company in China actually started 10 years earlier. It was a joint venture with three companies, Chang'an, Ford, and Mazda. But that company had dissolved when we created this Chang'an Ford, and we um, actually bought out Mazda. But the good news for me, there was a Ford employee that was on site, seconded, within that company for 10 years. So I went to him, his name was Steve, and I said, Steve, you know, here's what I'm trying to do. What do you think? So he gave me some advice. He said, number one, <clears throat> everybody must save face. There's a cultural thing in China called saving face, which means you never, ever let anybody be embarrassed, which is really good, by the way. But it, it, it's really personal. Uh, Chinese leaders almost live in fear of making the wrong decision. So decisions are slow. If you make the wrong decision, it's a disgrace to you. It's a disgrace to your company. It's a disgrace to your family and to your parents. It's very, very personal. So he said, you need to be careful with this. Make sure everybody can save face when this is over. So understood. He also told me that subordinates never negotiate with their supervisors. So therefore, I couldn't negotiate with my boss. Um, but really, it was, it was really a double bind. I'm not allowed to um, 
negotiate with my boss because we just don't do that. But then I'm asked to negotiate with my subordinate, the deputy director, but she's not allowed to negotiate with me. So it was really kind of an odd setup. But he told me what was really going to happen is I was going to negotiate with people that would go back and meet with decision makers in the home companies. And they would make a decision in the background. I would probably never meet the people that agreed. But I would be talking to people that are going to present the case that I have. So I had to keep that in mind and recognize that um, I would negotiate with folks and they were going to go, and it was going to take longer. They were going to go back and talk to the home parent company, which really just makes sense. And it would just take a while. So that was the counsel I got from my friend Steve that had been there 10 years. So what is my bat number? So what's the best alternative to a negotiate agreement? In this particular case, <clears throat> I sat down with the Ford team and they had some good experience because they had worked there on and off for 18 months with a local team. Most of us had, most of us had launched um, new factories and we knew that it was very, very complex and very, very hard work. And so we decided it was everything. Our batna was this, we're going for all 26 people. There would be no compromise. Um, so therefore we have to be successful. We need to understand how do we get everybody to say yes. So here's what I decided to do. Since I knew I would be negotiating with the local team and, and probably some other people in the background that I wouldn't be able to speak with, I needed to make sure that my boss, the VP of manufacturing was aligned. But I, he told me not to negotiate with him, to negotiate with the team. So I was in a bit of a, another double bind there. So I went to, his name, his name is Lo Ming Gang. I said, Mr. Lo, I said, we need to meet every week and talk about the business. So my plan was I would come in and see, and we talk about all the business of what's going on, building construction on time, supp supply base readiness and preparation, strategies, training, hiring, all the business. And in the end, as just a part of the business report out with you, I would say, well, here's our progress around bringing 26 experts on board from North America. I wouldn't say here's our progress in negotiation on how many people we're gonna bring on board. I would say here's our progress from hiring 26 people and bringing them on board. And I'd say, you know, really, if I think about bringing people over with 20 years experience times 26, I'm talking, I'm thinking about bringing 520 years of experience into this young team. So I was always very positive and always direct. This is what we need to go do. Now this had a side benefit to it. As him and I continued to talk week after week and our relationship grew, I knew that he needed to protect my face, to protect my reputation. Because now I'm the director and I've pretty much made a decision. I just don't have alignment. And he felt compelled at some point to support me so I don't get embarrassed. It's kind of an, an end around negotiating strategy that I used. But when it came down to the basic strategy, there's two elements that I, that I had to focus on for the team. So I sat down with this team in this conference room where we looked at the whiteboard and I said, first things first, let's agree on where we're gonna go. And I call this cast vision often and cast it big. I told the team, I said, look, here's what we wanna do. We wanna go build a world-class manufacturing facility. And we get to do this because we're starting new. We get to do this right because we know how to do it. We get to do this because we're really good at what we do. In fact, we're gonna be so good at this factory in the end, that the North American people and the European people that have similar factories are gonna to come to us and say, how did you do it? How is this so, so successful? Can you teach us? And everybody got excited about this because the reality is all people are the same in this regard. We want to be part of something greater than ourselves. And anyway, so I, I cast this vision over and over and it had complete buy-in that we're going to go be the best in the world at what we do. From there, we need to go back to the size of the pie. So what are the common interests here? What do we need to be the best in the world? What does that look like? Well, it always starts with the people. So we went through an exercise where we develop accountability charts roles and responsibilities and skill levels that we need to go into this accountability chart. It's an organizational structure. And we talked about fears. We talked about what if scenarios during the launch. We talked about talent. We talked about skills. We talked about technology, complexity. 
how do we introduce the technology and the complexity to 1,500 workers over time? We even developed our, our one-year, two-year, and three-year organizational structures and then started populating with people and needs. The idea was continue to expand the pie of interests and needs so we can understand how do we get there as a group. Well, this is fundamentally what happened, which kind of broke us open to a successful negotiation. We came up with three fears, and we had to answer these fears. After all the discussion, it came down to this. Fear number one, three years is a long time. We're really going to hire 26 people, bring them on board at this half a million dollars a person number for a three-year commitment to the idea that came out. Well, what if we do a one year with an option for three? We talked about that, but thought, well, we could do that. We could, we could extend offers to people for one and a half years, because that'd be a minimum number. And we have an option to extend. That would be fair. So we took care of that fear. Fear number two, would we pick the right coaches? How would we pick these subject matter experts? Would they be the best friends of the, of the Ford people that are coming over already? Or, or how do you decide? So we agreed to have an interview process. So we'd have three Chung on people in the interview process, three, four people in the interview process. We'd interview the subject matter experts and agree on the right ones for the world that we have and the needs that we have that we just spent all these days defining. And then uh, fear number three, would the subject matter experts work on the right things? Meaning, they come over here, how do they know that we're going to work on the right assignments? How will they best support the team? And so the Chongan group and this, this local team, we decided, well, they're going to report to the people that they're coaching. Now, this was a hard sell on the Ford side, because now I'm going to ask maybe a supervisor of engineering with 40 years experience to come and work and report to a 26-year-old supervisor in China who had never seen what he was about to do. So this was a bit of a, a twist and some diff caused me some difficulties on the recruiting side. However, we agreed to do it. SMEs would report to the people they're coaching. So they would have control and to ensure that they were working on the right things. So the, a bit of the long and the short of this was this. Um, preparation was important. Understanding the culture was important. Developing relationships was important. Defining interests and fears very important, and then developing the variance. And I'll, and I'll tell you the end of the story. We, we did bring all 26 over, and they did stay for the full three years and then some. The one bit of Chinese culture that I didn't understand at the time is when you become part of the team, you become part of the family. And so there was no worry about bringing people over for 1.3 years. They got along with the team, and they added value. Everybody wanted them to stay for three years. And in fact, when we tried to send people home after three years, there was resistance. Can we just keep people longer? It was, it was said. Um, so this kept, kept, just went on and on. I'm going to go back to the presentation. Get out of this. Yeah. Uh, let's see, there's a couple of points I want to make. Uh, maybe while you're doing that, I'll jump in and um, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to just tell people that uh, um, we have two more events this week. Um, so there was today and then tomorrow and uh, on Thursday. If you want to have more information about those events, you can find them on our Facebook, uh, the page for partner. Basically, tomorrow we have an interesting uh, seminar about what we've learned through COVID with um, uh, a man who heads up a very large community college in the United States. And on Thursday, Ron, Steve, and I will be talking about praying at work. So that'll be a, a different kind of a topic. Uh, so um, you're invited to, um, uh, to check both of those out. Um, each of those have a registration link uh, to complete for, um, for that. You see how to get your slides back up, Ron, or... Yeah, help yeah, I got the slides up, but I, um, for some reason I can't share the screen. It's okay though. So 
So basically, let me just talk about some last words. Um, number one, when it comes to negotiation, is protect your brand. Um, the brand represents you. And in this particular case, I need to protect my brand. I'm going to go negotiate with this team. And actually, I stayed there for five years. Um, it would be in multiple negotiations, but that baseline trust that we built and, and, and the relationship we built helped further negotiations to go very, very smooth. And when you're in business and you're negotiating with other people, and you're negotiating um, even different companies, your brand will become alive. It will precede you. People will know what kind of negotiator you are and what kind of deals you have and your reputation will proceed. So always keep your brand in mind. There's no such thing as a one-off negotiation. Number two, never lose control of your emotions. You always wanna be the stability in the room, the, uh, the strength, uh, the quiet calmness, always very important. Insist on fairness, uh, reason and be reasonable. And then lastly, pursue durability and trust. Um, this is what I mean. If a negotiation is done well, and people trust each other, it's durable. But oftentimes, don't even need to go back to the uh, to the writing or or the, the actual written negotiation because the the, the, the team believes in each other and they, and they they follow they trust each other to make decisions well. And you really need to go back to the written negotiation. All right, that is concludes. My, negoti my negotiations um, presentation. And so now. Well, that was great, Ron. Thank you uh, so much. Um, we have uh, a, a half an hour left of our time. So the, Ron did exactly what I asked him to, which I really appreciate, was to give us, give us a, a little bit of a, a framework for how he had uh, uh, worked with the negotiation, but to spend most of his time really getting us into a story. And I think it's pretty a pretty amazing one with tens of millions of dollars at stake in another country and something that's never been done before. Uh, and so I really enjoyed the details of that. I think it's um, always really amazing to hear, you know, even in such a big negotiation that, that the little things still really matter, that emotions and relationships are still very, very central to what's going on and that you you got to yes by um, dealing with uh, fears and uh, all sorts of, of things that, that we all deal with in every single negotiation. So I think this was a great example to, to see um, a really big high stakes negotiation, but I think it's still quite relevant to, to all of us wherever we are. Let me give you a couple um, uh, uh, but you can be thinking about your questions uh, as I just share a couple of things with you. One, I'm going to put a link in the chat um, where uh, videos uh, for this seminar tomorrow on Thursday will be posted. There's also actually one from yesterday. Um, we had a small discussion with a few people about um, anxiety in, in, in the workplace and so um, in leadership. So um, you can check that out and there's two different videos. One is the uh, video with the English audio and the other is with uh, Croatian audio. So um, you can save that, that link and follow Udruga Focus and see, um, see the videos for this as they show up. And the last thing I'll put in the, as a link is that we have a survey and it's not just a survey, so I'll, I'll put the survey in here. Uh, if you could um, at some point fill out the survey about the seminar. Uh, and, and also Steve and Ron are available for a few slots to talk to people in one hour segments, uh, which I will probably also be um, present um, just to help set everything up and to help with the language issues and things like that. Um, so if, uh, if you'll see in the follow up uh, in the in the survey for the or the evaluation, let's say for the for the webinar, um, a chance at the end to indicate you're interested and to leave um, your um, your name and your address. And so you don't you can fill out the, the evaluation anonymously unless you're asking uh, for us to kind of work on seeing if we can connect you with Ron and Steve, who are right now five hours before us. So um, when it's uh, when it's six here, it's it's one in the afternoon there. So those are my kind of um, housekeeping things that I have. 
you've been very, very patient. Uh, um, this is the now a part where if you have a question, you would like to unmute and to ask it, you can ask it in English or in Croatian, or the, probably the easiest thing would be is if you want to um, uh, write uh, questions in the chat box, and then, then we can kind of, uh, I can read them out loud to the guys. Um, uh, I know I, I also in the your registration for this event, you filled out a survey asking you what some of your questions, what if you had a burning question about um, negotiations. So I already have a number of people's burning questions about negotiations. So one of them that came up several times uh, was, uh, so Ron, I thought maybe you could kick it off just real quickly. What are your thoughts on uh, advice for people when they're negotiating for a raise at work? Actually, I had to do this one time in my life, and actually, it wasn't it was a raise, but I had to negotiate for a different position. Yeah, or or a promotion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So a promotion. Um, oftentimes, raises are more difficult because, um, yeah, I just I, I've struggled with that. But um, but different positions. That's a negotiation. So um, I always go with the same way the HR team does it. Kind of kind of a turn it back on the way that the way they make decisions. Uh, look around for similar positions in the company or other like companies and what those positions look like and what they pay, get the inside detail, share it with the supervision and say, hey, look, you know, this, this is um, a similar organization. They have similar goals, similar products, similar whatever. And the position looks like X. Position here looks like Y. What are the real differences? And in the end, this other position that we want to create or we want to go into and work, this is what it looks like. This is how I think I would fit into this position and try to do that, do all the homework to make it very, very easy for the leadership uh, to, to build your case. And, and, and I've done that before. It was actually one time when I was in China, um, I was responsible for what I was responsible for. And I looked for like organizations in Europe and in North America that were responsible, very, very similar, almost exact, but there was some things that weren't equal. And I said, you know, to make this what I think fair, because fairness is a is an important word for most people. And then when you're talking to senior leaders, they always want to be fair. But but you have to do your homework to to share where you're going to go and why you think it's important. Thank you. Um... We have about 30 people on the call with us here and um, would love to have you give any feedback or ask a question or make a comment um, in the chat, or you can also unmute yourself. If you do unmute yourself, if you have a, a camera as well, it'd be nice if you would um, turn your camera on uh, when you speak too, so that uh, everybody can hear you. If I may, I have a question for Ron. Yeah, go for it. Hey, Ron, uh, good to see you. Um, so could you give us an example of uh, when you um, when you left the table uh, when you know for example for whatever reasons but um, when just the, the deal went south or something and when you just um, walked away um, and because you know, I, I think that's that's also an important aspect of negotiations knowing when to uh, walk away so if you have that example, uh, I would appreciate it. And maybe uh, maybe even tell us why did you uh, walk away? Thank you. Thanks. Sure. I'm sorry. Great question, Lauren. Thanks. That, that is a great question. Um, <clears throat> one thing about me that I haven't shared is um, I have a small um, invest property investment company that um, I buy properties and for a specific reason. Now this can be, this is always a negotiation. I know when you're spending money buying properties, it's, there's a negotiation behind what you're gonna do and why you're gonna go do it. And this is where the BATNA comes in. It's your best, your, 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 your win, what does it look like? You gotta know when to walk away and when to stay. So, so I'll spend the time up front to make things easy on me during negotiations because I don't want it to be nego emotional on my part. I don't want to make a decision because I just like something or it feels good that day. I'm going to go buy a piece of property. Uh, say I'm going to buy a, um, a house for rental income. Um, 
I'll decide up front, what is my bat now? What's my best, what's my win-win look like for me? Best alternative to negotiate agreement. That way when I'm in a negotiation, I will not vary from what is satisfies for my life. For example, if I'm gonna buy a property for investment, I'm gonna know what the rents are like in the area. I'm gonna need to know what it's gonna cost me to fix the house up, get it prepared. And then I have a, um, what I'll say, a, a return on investment that I require. And so if I return on investment during negotiation, I still can't make what I think I need. I can walk away easily. Now it's different if I'm buying a piece of property for my family to live in, because then it gets emotional. That's more difficult. Um, <laughs> if it's close to where I, I work, or it has a great view, or if my wife just loves it, well, those are emotions that I can't change. <laughs> so um, I, I would suggest creating your best alternative for negotiate agreement, even when you're buying a property for your family or, or something that's going to be emotional, because at least you're going to have to know when to walk away and, um, and make sure your wife is in agreement with what you're doing. Um, so, so that's what I do. I, I spend the, the, the homework on, on, the, on the win at the beginning, so I'm clear when a walk away point is. And um, only negotiations I, I could think of that I walked away from is, and I've walked away from a few deep into negotiation on property. Um, at the end, we just couldn't figure out how to make it work um, from a financial and, a, and from a financial perspective. Can I add something to that? Um, you know, whenever we've negotiated, for example, on a house, and I bought many houses, and one, one time I was in a six month negotiation and whenever you go into something like that, you talked about your best alternative. You also want to try to know as much about the seller as you can and anticipate what their best agreement is. What do they need? Do they need to be out quick or have they got plenty of time? Do they need the money really badly or they don't need it that badly? Do, are they moving to something smaller and therefore they might leave furniture and appliances behind if you ask? Or are they going to a place bigger where they need everything they have? And all of those are part of creating the best agreement. When you understand them and their needs for the win-win, you can re-articulate or recreate the agreement in a way that's creative, like you said, that you can get to it quicker because you understand what they want out of it. It's just more of what you said. Um, maybe some people in the group are also feeling a bit shy. I think there was a, um, a number of people in their responses seem to say, I, I, I struggle to be calm in negotiations. I struggle to um, to be able to assert myself. Uh, Ron, have you watched other people who are um, maybe more introverted or shy uh, build their skills in negotiation? Or uh, uh, do you have any advice on people for whom they feel like this is a, a very uh, exhausting thing to do? Or were you born good at this? Or did you have to really work your way up at this yourself? You're still muted. Sorry. Yeah. Was that thanks. a minute ago? Yeah. No, no, no. You're just just for a second. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, I, I think it's practice. Um, you, you need to set up negotiations that that you can practice um, and 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 seek them out. Maybe they're not going to be real personal, but you want to get involved in those negotiations. I remember when I first read the book um, "Getting to Yes." I volunteered for a negotiation right off the bat. My wife said I was crazy. We, we worked in, we were in a um, homeowners association, which means we belong to a community of, and that has several homes in it. And, and you have to pay into a fund to like maintain the road or um, the pool or the signage or something. And you pay into it. You agree when you buy the property, you're going to join the association and make your payment. And there was one fellow in, 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 on the, in, the, in the community, he refused to pay. He was delinquent for, for three to four years. And um, he would never pay. 
and everybody this else. This is paid. all really relevant because most of us, I think, live in apartment buildings where there's someone like that who's not paying into the um, common fund. <laughs> yeah, there's actually uh, um, lawyers that specialize this and attorneys and getting people to pay. It's just crazy. And uh, for me, I'm thinking, well, you signed up to pay when you just do it, right? But anyway, there were some tales to why this guy didn't pay and refused to pay. And I, I wasn't even part of the board of directors or the president or the treasurer. And then I just read the book and I said to my, to my wife, I said, I'm going to go get, his name was EJ. I said, I'm going to get EJ to go pay this year's um, payment in the last three years. And she said, well, you're crazy. Why would you want to put yourself through that? He said, hey, he's a hothead. He's going to scream and yell. It's going to be, this is going to happen. And it's, this is just nuts. I said, well, because I want to work on my skills. I mean, worst case is he tells me no, and I, and I learned something. Best case is I'm going to be a hero in the community because he paid. <laughs> and we calmed everybody down, and, and now he's moving back to normalcy. So I volunteered for that, and, um, and, it, and it actually worked. It, I followed this, the, the, what we just talked about today. Um, the formula for, for why and, and talking with the fellow and, and going through the needs that he had and his concerns and his fears and, and walk through it. And I walked away with a check. I, I still remember the check for $400. It was the year he was in plus three prior years. And I walked away and I handed it to my wife and said, well, maybe this negotiating uh, process actually works. So, but if I, but I learned something in the end I, and it gained, and I gained confidence because I volunteered for this, kind of crazy adventure to go meet with EJ. There's a comment uh, that uh, Christina made. She said, um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Ron. I liked that in the, how you um, in the beginning uh, said that we need to focus on, um, on people's interests and not on their position. So yeah. That's a... Yeah, you took a very um, inform a kind of, Again, like kind of informal or, or a real focus on this in terms of the hard and people's emotions and less about contracts and getting things down on paper. And um, I guess it's easy to think that the bigger you go in the business world, that the more people would regulate things based on contracts because it gets really complicated and there's tons of money on the table. And um, I think it's a very interesting perspective again to, to be able to say that it, it worked on that level. Um, Steve, I don't know if you have any thoughts on the, that issue as well. Contracts versus, uh, or, or the personal versus the, the details kind of stuff. I, I think the point that Ron made about cultural differences is really important. Um, having lived in Japan and having to do negotiating, I ran into the same thing where we were negotiating, for example, an equipment design change with an American and Japanese in the room. And uh, we couldn't come to agreement. And I finally realized that the reason we couldn't is because the person who was making the recommendation on the Japanese side was the oldest man in the room. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, age is everything. And if we didn't take his design, he would be dishonored. And I realized we couldn't, we couldn't come to an agreement. And the way you handle that in Japan is you leave the room you shut off the negotiation and then you do something called, in, in Japanese, it's called nimawashi, but it, in English, it's massaging. So you go meet one-on-one -on -one with that person until they come to, you and they personally come to the agreement so that they don't lose face. And then you go back to the table and then they say what they believe is the right answer and you move on and they're, they were not dishonored then. And so that was so different than an American way of negotiating. Uh, and we had to get really sensitive to how that culture thinks in order to come to agreement. It's very personal and it's very much has to do with society's norms in the culture you're in. I think those are great points, and I, I, um, I've lived in Croatia for 20 years, and I hope I wouldn't um, offend anyone who's with us today in saying this, but uh, I think that a lot of those kinds of, uh, Croatia is not China or Japan, but there is actually a lot of sensitivity around things like making the leader look bad, uh, in, and I don't think that works anywhere. 
Um, and I, I think that uh, uh, that's something to really be to be thoughtful about, um, to really ask yourself, you know, look at everybody around the room and think like, if we get to the agreement I would really like us to get to, does this make somebody look bad or really uh, put them in an awkward position? Um, because we're all very emotional beings. And if that's true for any of us, that's gonna be very, very likely to provoke us to, to just being stubborn and, you know, saying we don't wanna agree with something, even if it's not in the best interest of the whole uh, group. Um, I don't know if either of you have to think and maybe think of examples of people who are because uh, in the comments I got from people I think there was a sense of again just uh, gee could I be good at negotiation so maybe if you think about other colleagues you had uh, I don't know do you have any insights on what you've seen in terms of men versus women in negotiation or introverts versus extroverts or kind of what um, uh, uh, what you've seen in terms of how a person can develop themselves to be better in negotiation. One thing I do when I go to buy a truck is I send my wife. Really? Yes. And why is that? Because just like Ron and his wife, I have the emotional stake in it. <laughs> I want the truck. My wife doesn't have that stake. And so we strategize on who's going to negotiate for which vehicle. And it's always the disinterested party that goes and does the negotiation because they have the best ability to walk away and force the other party to come to their terms. And so she buys my vehicles and I buy her vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. You know, you know what? Here's the thing though. We're all negotiators. I mean, if you, mm. everybody in this call is an expert negotiator. Mm. I, you know, when, when my eight-year-old comes home from school today, he's going to have a plan. He's going to want to, he's going to say, I think this is what we need to do for the rest of the day. He's going to negotiate a game. He's going to negotiate something that he wants to go do. So I think it's naturally in us that we, I mean, when Steve talked about, we all buy vehicles or whatever. Um, and we're going to be some level of negotiation. We negotiate with our spouses. I mean, I, my wife says, we're going to, I'd like to go to the beach for vacation. And I tell her, I want to go to Colorado and go skiing for vacation. Well, there's a negotiation. We're going to, we're going to come up with a conclusion, something that's going to work for both of us. So, I, so if you think about it, we're all expert negotiators. It's really just a matter of adding to our skills and our tools to move forward. That's, that's a great point. I think that uh, teenagers are fantastic natural negotiators. Um, they're tenacious. They know exactly what they want. <laughs> and, and so for many of us, maybe sometimes we forget um, natural, more, more in, in uh, natural skills we might have had at some point earlier along. There's another question here. So I, let me just take a second to, or a comment, let me just take a second to um, uh, absorb it. Um, Mm. Oh, okay. So I had that kind of a situation when I was looking for a job in my expertise. Um, uh, and I am looking for any kind of uh, similar work and a couple of people thanking you for the comments. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see, we have a couple, few more minutes. Please, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question and you can do so in Croatian and we can translate it back into English for you. You know, when, when you're looking for a job, let's say there's a job posting and you think you're a fit for it and it, what you can do is you take the posting and you break it down, left, left side, right side. And, and recruiters and, and people that are employers actually appreciate this. You could take their posting and write down, this is the, the job skill, the left side, and then how you apply, how, how you, your skill set fits. It may not be exact because you come from a different industry, but you have that skill set to support that need or experience and list it on the right side. Now, when you send that in, you've just started negotiation. Hmm. It doesn't feel like a negotiation. It feels like a fact finding mission or, or, or just providing good information, but you've started a negotiation of this is what you need. This is what I can provide. This is the commonality from my experience to what you need. So negotiation could be easily used in finding employment. 
Is that I, like, how do you deal with that? Are you saying even, even with some of them, you don't formally fill, like you don't have the same number of years of experience in that industry that they're technically asking for or something, but you, you go ahead and emphasize what you do. Right. You know, so if I, if I wanted to work, say, I'm, a, I'm in the automobile business, but I have high expertise in quality systems. Quality systems are, are absolutely my strongest skill. I believe I could go work in the food industry. Mm -hmm. Food really, food industry needs very high quality systems. Now, my, my, my technical expertise and the tools that I use are probably different, but the systems are outstanding. And I would go highlight to the food industry. I, the reason I'm thinking about this, I have a friend of mine who's applying for a job uh, in the candy industry, but he's, he's a long time um, um, <laughs> manufacturing industry person. <laughs> and, and literally, I'm going to know in a couple of days, he might move to Tennessee because he's going to work for a candy company. Um, but, he, but it's certainly nothing that he's ever done before. <laughs> but, but he's been able to, to, to negotiate, I think, based on his strong experience with like industries with similar skill sets. But I think that's going to work for him. There's a question um, in the box. Yeah, yeah, there's a great question in the box. Any tips on how to negotiate when walking away isn't an option? I was recently in such a position where I, when I needed to get a short-term job and the details of the contract, which were already signed, were changed, I ended up accepting because I turned down another opportunity, which was no longer available. How to negotiate back into a better position? That's a tough one. Good question. So maybe you feel like you already signed something. <laughs> you guys both did Ron freeze, or you think <laughs> maybe but you signed something and then somebody, uh, a little Darth Vader move. Um, I've altered the agreement. Pray don't alter it any further. You know, what do you do when you really feel like you have the bad hand, or um, uh, you know, you really need to make it work? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you have to, to call that out. I think it, it needs to be very upfront and transparent. I think that you're going to go work on the relationship, you know, um, and, and, and use some of those tools I talked about early. Not you, you change the contract. You, you, you're not fair. Is this maybe it's, you know, I felt like this is what we agreed to. And I'm feeling now that we're somewhere else. And I'm trying you, to get. The, can you say a little more about that? Because somebody mentioned that even in their 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 question before we started. What what is the why is it different to say why is it different to say I feel like as opposed to hey you, why is that a different approach? Yeah, when you call somebody out with you, it becomes defensive. The immediate thing you hear is you said or you did this. It's almost like you're accusing them of something. And they get a little bit of anxiety and you're in, 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 in the negotiation, you're trying to get rid of anxiety. You want people to feel comfortable and open. And so that's why I, I, I actually learned this from my, from my daughter. Whenever things don't, I disagree with her. She would come back and say, well, I felt like this. Cause she knows with me, if she tells me you said, or you didn't do this, or you, I, I might get a little defensive because I'm just, my personality style is very direct. Uh, and, 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 and so I, I think that's, that's the way to go is just try to keep it more neutral in terms of the conversation and get away from people feeling anxiety. I think uh, on that question, there's almost always an option to walk away. It's just a matter of what consequences are you willing to live with? Meaning, you may have to find a different job. The other is how much do they know about whether you have an alternative or not? If they know that there's no option, then you're kind of on the short end. But if they don't know, there's always the possibility of them thinking you have other options. So you have a better leverage position to try to negotiate back to the original agreement. And I would put it under the category of fairness in dealing. And using feelings is appropriate when you talk about things like we call I statements. The I statement deals with how you feel about what happened. When I see terms change in the contract that, that go against me, I feel such and such. 
Now, the reason you say that is because people can argue against facts, but they have a hard time arguing against your feelings. They're your feelings. And so it's like, you got to deal with my feelings and it puts it onto a personal level that a lot that causes them to perhaps maybe even feel guilty about making the change. A good point. Yeah, or potentially winning, winning some reserve of goodwill for future, um, uh, in a future situation, if if they have to, you know, I have to admit we didn't treat you fairly in that situation. Um, and I think too, maybe slowly, I see things changing in Croatia of people becoming a little bit more willing to believe in themselves or to, to say, I, I, I see I have some, some place in, in, the, in employment to negotiate, maybe not in a, in, a, in a kind of manual labor job, but often in, in, in professions. Um, I think it's, it's always good to just remember that, that a hiring process is a big, long, complicated thing for a company and they don't wanna exactly just go start it all over again. Um, and so when you're able to, um, to say, hey, you know, we, I'm exhausted by this process, but you're probably, it's been a long process for you as well. So let's uh, try and really make sure we have a happy agreement here. Um, by the way, I negotiated into an assignment and a raise and a promotion. In a one day? That, yeah, well, here's how it happened. I, I realized that there, were, there was a certain position that was needed to start up the Japanese plant. And I felt I wanted that job, but I wasn't in the right department. I wasn't in the right discipline. Nothing was right that I was going to get that. So I wrote a job description for the job that was needed over there. And then I wrote a resume that happened to match that job description. And so I went to all the hierarchy and first put down the job description. And I say, I think this is going to be needed in Japan. Would you agree? And they read it and they said, well, yeah, that's absolutely what we need there. Then I handed them my resume and say, and here is why I'm the best person for that. And it was irrefutable logic that caused them to just break out laughing and say, well, I, I got to admire your gumption, you know, your, your, your initiative. And, but it's one position higher than what you are right now. And I said, so what's the problem? And uh, eventually I got promoted, which came with a raise. And, um, and so I worked my way into that by, by being, by showing the facts of what's needed and why I'm the best person. Great story. All right, anybody have a last, last burning question? You've just been waiting this whole time. We have three minutes left. We've just been holding on. Uh, uh, let's see, but there was, I think several people said they negotiated with their suppliers, not just customers, but suppliers. Um, maybe, Ron, you have a quick story about how, what it's like to talk to some, what are some things that come up in discussions with suppliers? Mm. Well, think about that. So for me, suppliers would mean people that are providing products to my company. Yeah. For me to use. And typically what worked well for me there is I would always try to find out what do they really need? What kind of communication do they need? How do I make their jobs better? How do I make their world um, more satisfying? How can they work with us? What would they like to see different from the big Ford Motor Company that we could do to make their experience with us better? And then if I keep turning it to the point where what's, what's best for them, in the end, here, think about that though. What's best for a supplier is best for the person using the product. So it's really a win-win. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I spent a large part of my career investing in suppliers and giving them, helping them get what they need to be successful because in the end, they, uh, they're they gonna help our, us be successful. Wow. Hey Ron, they're asking for some, uh, some literature uh, or recommendations. Oh, for great, reading. yes. Yeah, let's, uh, it, um... What's the, uh, can you say, I'll try and type it out. Can you, or what's the name of the book again you were, that you had mentioned during your presentation? Getting to get, Yes. Getting to Yes. You know, they also wrote a book called Getting Past No, which, which is really when you're dealing with people that are unethical or difficult or almost impossible to work with. Um, not a book you need very often because I don't 
want to be in those negotiations, <laughs> but uh, I have been in those negotiations because of my experience with uh, large labor unions. And so I've read both books. Uh, so if you, if you think you need to negotiate with people that are going to be extremely difficult, uh, the getting past no is, is another addition that they put out later that I think uh, could be of value. But again, right. I that, still negotiations that I could. That's, that's uh, uh, Fisher Uri Patton. Is that, Richard, is that right? Richard, uh, Richards and Uri. I think it's William Uri. Uri, okay, yeah. Richards' um, first name at this point. I actually have not read a lot of books on, on that subject. Um, a friend of mine just bought a book on the subject. I'm looking, trying to look it up real quick. Yeah, that's a famous institution is the Harvard Negotiation Project uh, yeah. Um, yeah. for a so very long there's time. There's probably better books out there. And I, and I think there's been some updated editions also. Yeah, yeah. I found an updated edition of the of um, Getting to Yes that's, uh, I think, uh, yeah more and more people here have access to being able to buy books on kindle and it's five dollars on kindle right now oh really okay yeah well i will just um here at the end say again uh you have a couple different ways to connect one is that yeah the the link i put in earlier to the uh um a youtube channel where this will be posted and some other content as well i think you even have some content from ron and steve from last year up there uh there is the uh i partner um uh, Facebook page, which has the links for registration for tomorrow and for Thursday. And also um, in the evaluation for tonight's seminar that, that I put the link in for, you can um, indicate your interest if you would like a chance to have a, a one hour Zoom call conversation with Steve or Ron and uh, uh, sometime over the next few days. Um, we, I'll just say well, Thursday is the chance to kind of be in a similar um, environment like this again. It might sound surprising at first, but the topic we are going to address is is praying at work. And um, uh, it was interesting in people's responses to that event saying, gee, I don't even really know if I'm allowed to ask uh, or if it's, if it's a good idea to pray about work. And so um, you, you took a very warm, interpersonal, human response to to negotiation uh, in this time we had together. And so I think that the, it'll be very interesting sort of parallel there to when, when you're in those situations and thinking about you know, how, how is, uh, is praying actually come, in, come into the room at all in, in those kinds of discussions as well. So um, feel, please feel free to come back and join us um, on Thursday. Um, and tomorrow it'll be a big uh, meeting. Uh, we often have about 150 people from all over Europe on those monthly uh, webinars that have been um, really growing over time. So that's a, it's a, we always have a good crowd from Croatia as well. So thank you everybody for being with us this evening. And uh, again, the, the recording of this will go up online uh, uh, tomorrow or the next day, see how, if I have any computer problems or not. But uh, thank you very much all of you for being with us. And uh, Hope that you have a, a really nice evening. And Ron and Steve, thank you so much for joining us again, all the way from, from America and um, uh, um, making time. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Thank all you. Right.